Hello, everyone, and welcome to week one of our webinar series, Introduction to Remote Sensing for Ocean and Coastal Applications. My name is Sherry Palacios, and I will be your instructor for this webinar series. For this course, we have one session per week each Wednesday. The meeting time will be from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The webinar will consist of lecture, in-class demonstrations, and homework exercises. Webinar recordings can be found after each session at the webinar website listed here. A question and answer period will follow each webinar lecture, and questions can be sent via email to me, and my email is down at the bottom there. We will have two homework assignments after week two and after week four, which will be submitted through Google Forms. The homework link will be available starting in weeks two and four. To receive credit for homework, you must submit all answers via Google Forms by the deadline. The deadline for both homework assignments is August 10th. To receive a certificate of completion, you must attend all four live webinars and complete both homework assignments. It takes some time to process these certificates, so you can expect to receive them about three months after the completion of the course. There is one prerequisite for this course. It is the Fundamentals of Remote Sensing, Session 1. You can watch this one-hour recorded webinar on your own time. If you have not already watched it, that's OK. Just try to watch it before week two. As I mentioned before, you can access all the course materials on the RSET website. Each week, you will be able to find a PDF of the PowerPoint presentation in both English and Spanish. The Spanish versions will be available at a later date. A link to view the recording of each week's webinar, and the PDF of each homework assignment and a link to the Google Form for homework submission. Again, those homework links will be available in weeks two and four. Please note that in order to view the webinar recordings, you must register. This helps us keep track of who is, who is viewing them. Once you register, you'll be automatically taken to view the recording. So why take this course? The objective of this course is to provide an overview of NASA Earth observation resources available for open ocean and coastal applications, including a basic understanding of remote sensing of aquatic systems, how to access and visualize NASA Earth Science data, how to use NASA Earth Science data, tools, and products for open ocean and coastal applied science issues, and to conduct live demonstrations of useful ocean and coastal applied science. The ultimate goal is to learn how remote sensing can be used as a tool for applied science questions. On the right, You'll, be, you'll see an image of the Cambridge Gulf in Western Australia, and you'll become familiar with images such as these. This one is from the Landsat 8 satellite, taken on May 12, 2013. The image shows the rich sediment and nutrient patterns in a tropical estuary and nearby vegetated areas. We will talk more about the different remote sensing satellites and sensors in week two of this webinar series. Those of you familiar with remote sensing methods may realize that this image has been enhanced. From this course, we hope you will gain knowledge and the ability to access, analyze, and apply satellite remote sensing data for coastal and ocean applied science. Gain an appreciation for the diverse types of remote sensing applied science tools that have been developed and also to learn about the advantages and limitations of using remote sensing observations for coastal and ocean applications. So the course outline. This week, I'll be giving an overview of satellite remote sensing in aquatic systems. In week two, I will cover satellite platforms and sensors commonly used for ocean observations. The primary focus of this webinar will be on NASA's Earth observing sensors. In week three, we will learn about remote sensing tools to understand animal movement and migration. And in the fourth week, I'll go over coral reef biology, satellite sensors used to understand coral reef health, and a remote sensing tool to forecast coral reef bleaching events. So far, I've already gone over the course structure and objectives. For the rest of this session, I will first give you a bit more background on RSET, review themes in coastal and open ocean applied science, give some examples of existing applied science tools for open ocean and coastal systems, provide an overview of aquatic optics 
both in water and for remote sensing imagery. And finally, to discuss the advantages and limitations of remote sensing in aquatic environments. The Applied Remote Sensing Training Program, or RSET, is part of NASA's Applied Sciences Program. Our goal is to increase the utility of NASA Earth Science data for applied resource management professionals, policymakers, and regulatory agencies. We conduct online and in-person trainings in a variety of application areas. Our webinars consist of multi-week sessions about a specific topic and can be a combination of lectures, live demos of a tool, and tutorials. All materials, including recordings of the webinars, are freely available on the RSET website listed above. RSET operates with a gradual learn approach where we often conduct basic introductory webinars followed by more in-depth advanced webinars or in-person trainings. Our in-person trainings are generally more in-depth with fewer numbers of participants. They also usually include case studies and participant projects that are relevant to the focused audience. These trainings require collaboration with another organization that can provide the meeting and lab space. We are also working to increase our train the trainer activities where we train specific targeted individuals to conduct their own remote sensing trainings. Our set conducts trainings <clears throat> in the focus areas of air quality, water resources, land management, wildfires, and disasters. The RSET team is located at multiple NASA centers and consists of scientists with backgrounds specific to the topic area they teach. Here are a few examples of the types of trainings we have conducted in the past. We have varied levels of trainings that can range from the basic to more advanced in-depth webinars and in-person trainings previously mentioned. RSET has completed over 68 trainings since it began in 2009 and has reached thousands of participants globally. The figure on the upper right shows the geographic distribution of participating organizations in the U.S. and globally. The local, lower figure shows how the RSET program has grown in recent years with a large increase in the number of participants. Our online trainings are in high demand with our international audience especially in regions where there is little in-situ data and or resources available. We have the unique opportunity to engage a large, highly varied audience that has a need for remote sensing, but does not yet know how to access the data or incorporate it into their current workflow. RSET is a resource for connecting applied tools and remote sensing to end users for enhanced decision making. As stated before, RSET follows a gradual learning approach and provides basic trainings, including webinars and workshops. These assume no prior remote sensing knowledge. An example of a basic training is this webinar. RSET also offers more advanced trainings, including webinars and in-person trainings focused on specific application problems and data. If you are interested in obtaining more information on upcoming courses and program updates, please sign up for the listserv by following the link below. Again, this webinar is available in the PDF in the chat um, uh, area panel in, your, um, in the presentation. One topic for this week includes themes in coastal and open ocean applied science. Some of the major thematic areas of coastal and open ocean applied science include marine protected areas, marine fisheries, animal migrations, water quality, harmful algal blooms or HABs, eutrophication, coral reef health, March subsidence, coastal development, and coastal hazards. Remote sensing can contribute to coastal and open ocean applied science by providing the information needed to establish no-take zones and marine protected areas, providing data for tools to limit bycatch by understanding the regions where vulnerable and protected species may be present alongside commercially fished species. By coupling remote sensing imagery with ocean current data and models to predict and track migrating animal species. By providing observations of water transparency or water quality in coastal and inland waters. These water quality assessments can be useful for tracking harmful algal blooms and indicating to water resource managers the safety of drinking water systems 
the safety of commercially harvested shellfish, or of swimming in natural waters. In addition, remote sensing measurements can be used to infer nutrient loading to aquatic ecosystems and its impact on nuisance aquatic vegetation or phytoplankton blooms. It can be used to monitor trends in coral reef cover and the impact of elevated sea surface temperature on coral reef survival. Over longer time periods, remote sensing imagery can be used to detect changes in coastal development and the impact on erosion, flow control, and subsidence of marshes. Remote sensing and sea level rise models can be used to forecast the impact of sea level rise on coastal structures. Agencies, corporations, and insurers can use these types of tools to mitigate risk with respect to sea level impacts on natural and human built environments. For the purpose of this webinar series, we will be focusing on two of these 10 thematic areas. We may return to the other thematic areas for a future RSET webinar series. In your feedback submitted to us at the end of the course, we will ask you to provide suggestions for themes to cover in a future webinar series. In addition to these on this slide, we welcome your suggestions for others. So what are some examples of coastal and open ocean applied science tools? The first example is for Turtle Watch, and you can see the link just below the title here. One goal of marine fisheries is to reduce bycatch, or the unintended catch of organisms not intended for market. One example of a tool to reduce turtle bycatch is the Turtle Watch experimental product. Turtle Watch provides up-to-date information about the thermal habitat of loggerhead sea turtles in the Pacific Ocean north of the Hawaiian Islands. It was created to reduce interaction between Hawaii-based longline fishing vessels and loggerhead turtles. Turtle Watch predicts the location of waters preferred by these turtles based on sea surface temperature and the ocean current conditions. The tool provides information to fishers to avoid fishing between the region on the map that falls between 63.5 and 65.5 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, as these are the regions that are most favored by the turtles. So between these two dark lines here in this region. Another applied science tool using remote sensing is the Gulf of Mexico Harmful Algal Bloom Bulletin. This region is affected by blooms of the toxic phytoplankton Karenia brevis. This organism produces a toxin that is aerosolized from the water and becomes airborne. When the airborne toxin migrates over land, it can have a negative impact on the people living near shore. The toxin causes respiratory distress and is particularly harmful to vulnerable people, for example, those with asthma. During these toxic airborne events, tourism is negatively affected. NOAA and other resource managers monitor for these events using the Gulf of Mexico HAB Bulletin. In this bulletin from 2005, October 2015, if you look in this region here around Tampa Bay, you see the U.S. state of Florida. And near the Tampa Bay region, there is a forecast for toxic conditions. It's a little bit hard to see on this image, but the um, point there is a red color. Another harmful algal species is the cyanobacterium microcystis aeruginosa. <clears throat> this cyanobacterium produces the toxin microcystin, which attacks the liver. This toxin can kill both quickly and slowly, depending on the dose. It can cause liver failure at high concentrations and liver tumors under prolonged low-dose exposure. This is a cosmopolitan organism that can be found in inland water systems throughout the world. Brazil is a leader in directly monitoring drinking water supplies for this toxin. More recently, the U.S. has begun monitoring using direct sampling and also remote sensing methods. The organism produces distinctive surface scums. As a result, these blooms can be identified using remote sensing imagery. Not only can they be identified, but some recent work from the NOAA Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab in Michigan in the United States has developed a tool using remote sensing imagery and hydro hydrodynamic modeling to predict the movement of these blooms. Such information can be used to better inform municipal drinking water suppliers of when to close their intakes or to treat the incoming water. 
Another example of an applied science tool for coastal systems is NOAA's Forecasting Sea Level Rise and Coastal Flooding Impacts tool. It provides coastal managers and scientists with a preliminary look at sea level rise and coastal flooding impacts under climate change scenarios. The data and maps can be used at different scales to understand trends and prioritize actions for different sea level rise scenarios. This interactive tool allows the user to view coastal flooding impacts over the sliding scale of sea level rise. It is currently restricted to U.S. coastal waters. I learned that while my house will be above the waterline under forecast sea level rise, my office will be more prone to coastal flooding in the future. These tools mentioned here use remote sensing imagery to inform resource managers and commercial entities. Fundamentally, they are bound to the rules of remote sensing of aquatic targets, a topic that we will cover next. The first step in any discussion of remote sensing requires an overview of the electromagnetic spectrum. For our purposes, electromagnetic radiation is radiant energy from the sun at different wavelengths. We are mainly interested in the light in the visible range, or 400 to 700 nanometers, and in the thermal range. If you are familiar with terrestrial or land remote sensing, the near and infrared shortwave uh, the near and shortwave infrared regions are also used, but because of the absorption of light by water at those wavelengths, we do not use those ranges for aquatic remote sensing. So primarily what we want to know is what is the light in the visible range and what are we seeing in terms of the thermal range. So how does light interact with the water? Light from the sun passes through the atmosphere and if it reaches the sea surface, it may, it may reflect off the surface or pass through it. The fate of a photon is to be either scattered or absorbed. If absorbed, phytoplankton, non-algal particles, colored dissolved organic matter, or CDOM, <clears throat> or water itself will absorb the light. If scattered, it will do so in either the forward or backward direction. If in the backward direction, some of it will be re-emitted from the sea surface. In aquatic remote sensing, we are interested in the radiometric unit, the remote sensing reflectance. The reflectance from remote sensing. <clears throat> remote sensing reflectance is used in ocean color algorithms to compute the data products of interest for ocean and aquatic science, like the chlorophyll A concentration. Remote sensing reflectance can be defined as the ratio of backscattering to the total absorption and backscattering as affected by the local sun and sky conditions represented by the constant C in this equation. Alternatively, remote sensing reflectance can be defined as the ratio of the water leaving radiance or the light that is being re-emitted out of the surface just above the surface to the incoming or downwelling irradiance incident on the sea surface. With this equation, we see the relationship of the inherent optical properties, what we've already described of absorption and scattering of the material in the water, to the quantity and quality of light in the underwater light field and emergent from the surface. Remote sensing reflectance is derived from satellite remote sensing measurements. Because of these relationships of what is in the water to the color of light emitted from it, we can infer concentrations of optically active constituents in the upper part of the water column that the satellite can see. Remote sensing reflectance is the quantity the science community uses to infer the constituents of the water. On the left is a plot of a remote sensing reflected spectrum typical for a phytoplankton bloom. Along the x-axis is the wavelength and you'll be seeing a few of these plots, so I would like to point out these features. And on the y-axis is the remote sensing reflectance. If we were to measure the remote sensing reflectance of the sea surface using a handheld instrument called a spectroradiometer, this is the type of spectrum we could expect to get. As you can see, it has a peak at around 550 nanometers. This is also the region where the human eye perceives the color green. The image on the right is what the color of the bloom would look like to our eyes. 
Phytoplankton contain chlorophyll, and that is what is providing this green color our eye perceives. It is an optically active constituent in the water column and is of interest to aquatic scientists as it provides us with information about the biomass of the primary producers in the water, so the phytoplankton, the ecosystem function, carbon uptake through primary production, and water quality. And we'll be talking about chlorophyll over the next few slides. Several ocean properties can be derived from satellite remote sensing. Chlorophyll A is used as a proxy for biomass of photoautotrophs near the water's surface. Other aquatic properties derived from remote sensing imagery include water turbidity, color dissolved organic matter, or CDOM, sea surface temperature, and from other types of sensors, surface winds, and salinity. One of the most common questions I am asked from students about aquatic remote sensing is, how is it possible to obtain chlorophyll A from remote sensing imagery? In the next two slides, I hope to convey to you a high-level understanding of how we derive this biophysical data product from the imagery. <clears throat> Here is a schematic representation of the type of spectra one would obtain from waters with different chlorophyll concentrations. So on the left here, it's the repeat, but with more spectra of the um, spectrum you've been looking at. And on the right is an image that shows different concentrations of chlorophyll, a schematic image. The four example spectra on the left correspond to the images on the right. Spectra one is from water with the highest chlorophyll concentration, and each subsequent image has a decreasing chlorophyll concentration. This difference is also noted in the magnitudes of the spectra in the figure on the left. As chlorophyll concentration decreases, the peak height at around 550 nanometer also decreases. A few other features as well decrease in height. For example, this peak over here. The chlorophyll A algorithm is a fourth order polynomial relationship between a ratio of remote sensing reflectance or two, at two wavelengths and chlorophyll A. Or simply stated, the ratio of two remote sensing reflectant measures are used as inputs into the algorithm, and the result is an estimate for chlorophyll A. So for example, the value of the magnitude of these are used in the ratio that's fed into the algorithm, and then that is used to estimate what chlorophyll A is. Validation of the chlorophyll algorithm is performed by collecting sea truth measurements of chlorophyll within an hour of the satellite overpass. These in situ sea truth chlorophyll A, chlorophyll A measurements are then compared to the chlorophyll derived from satellite measurements and uncertainty is estimated. It is a surprisingly straightforward approach developed in the 1970s and 1980s that continues to be refined and used today to estimate chlorophyll A from space. There is more than one chlorophyll algorithm that can be used depending on the environment being studied. For example, open ocean versus coastal waters, and also which satellite sensor is being used. If you would like more details about the different chlorophyll algorithms, I suggest that you follow the link to the algorithm description listed below the spectrum. So now you have learned how chlorophyll A is derived from the first principles of aquatic optics and how it is possible to make quantitative estimates of global chlorophyll from space, as you see in the image here. This is a composite of MODIS imagery from March, April, May 2014, or springtime, in the Northern Hemisphere. We will discuss sensors in greater depth during next week's session. Note the chlorophyll concentra concentration scale along the right and also the patterns that you see in the Northern Hemisphere, particularly up here in the North Atlantic. During spring, phytoplankton respond to increasing light, warmer temperatures, an increased mixed layer depth, and the abundance of nutrients available to them. As a result, they proliferate and grow. The North Atlantic noticeably greens up during this period. If you look in the Southern Indian Ocean, or in the Southern Pacific Ocean, you will see very low concentrations of chlorophyll observed near the surface. This is because the regions do not support large phytoplankton blooms, mostly due to the availability of nutri nutrients. There may be blooms deeper in the water column where there is still light penetration, 
but the satellite sensor cannot detect these deep chlorophyll pools. Now that you know more about what is happening in the water column it, with respect to the optics, it is time to review satellite observing systems. For the purposes of this webinar, we are most interested in passive satellite sensors that measure reflected solar radiation in the visible range to use in our ocean color algorithms. We are also interested in measuring the emitted infrared and microwave radiation in order to observe sea surface temperature. We call these sensors passive because they are detecting the reflected or emitted light energy from the sun. They are not using independent sources of light for observing the Earth. I'd like to make sure that you note the path length that light or electromagnetic radiation takes as it travels from the sun through the atmosphere, interacting with the constituents of the atmosphere, and as it reflects off of the surface and again interacts with the atmosphere before it leaves, leaves it and reaches the sensor on the satellite. <clears throat> Satellite measurements can be used to infer characteristics of several Earth system spheres. Depending on the type of sensor and which part of the electromagnetic spectrum is used, information can be gained about the atmosphere, including clouds, aerosols, and gases, as well as the Earth's surface, including snow and ice, land vegetation, and for our interests, in the water. Sea surface temperature can be observed using sensors that detect emitted thermal radiation. Knowing sea surface temperature can give insight into the ocean heat budget, ocean current patterns and rates, and the rate of photosynthesis in primary productivity models, among other uses. The image on the right shows an eight-day average of sea surface temperature along the east coast of the United States. The deep red color along the state of Florida and northward to North Carolina, where it detaches from the coastline, is the Gulf Stream, a quick flowing western boundary current. After it detaches from the continent, turbulent flow encourages the formation of eddies, pointing to the formation of these eddies, which is evident on the eastern part of this image. These eddies can transport heat, salt, and materials into other parts of the ocean. As mentioned before, the remote sensing of water bodies is used to derive the properties of optically active water constituents. These include suspended sediments, algae, like this coccolithophore bloom um, up here on the right side uh, in Norway. It's just a true color image. Colored dissolved organic matter, floating vegetation, oil, and other materials. It is important to note that in aquatic remote sensing, it is often necessary to collect sea truth data coincident with the satellite overpass to validate the data products derived from the imagery. Water bodies dominated by phytoplankton, colored dissolved organic matter, suspended sediments, or detrital particles have distinctive water colors that are detectable in the shape of their remote sensing reflective spectra. Note how when you look at each of these images of what the watercolor looks like to our eyes, those differences are also reflected in the shape that we see and the magnitude that we see of these, the remote sensing reflectance spectra for these different water types. Recall that the material in the water column influences the light re-emitted through the water surface or the water leaving radiance. It is the ratio of the water leaving radiance to downwelling light or irradiance that gives us the remote sensing reflectance quantity. From a boat or a dock, I can measure remote sensing reflectance with a handheld spectroradiometer. <clears throat> Note this image is not to scale. Airborne or satellite sensors also measure the water leaving radiance, but from a much higher off the water than a boat. The light reaching this sensor has traveled through the atmospheric column, interacting with the small particles, or what we call aerosols, water vapor, ozone, and gases. The amount of light reaching the satellite is significantly reduced. 
As a result, it is necessary to so-called correct for the light scattered and absorbed in the atmosphere in its path from the sun to the surface and from the surface back out of the atmosphere to the satellite sensor. Almost 90% of the radiance signal detected by the satellite sensor is due to the atmosphere and only 10% is from the water's surface. Water is a dark target, so very little light is being emitted compared to land or ice. So the sensors used for aquatic remote sensing must have high signal to noise so that they have the sensitivity to detect the dark water surface even through the filter of the atmosphere. The images on this slide show the Narragansett Bay, Rhode Island, in the United States. On the left is an uncorrected image taken above the atmosphere. On the right is the same image, but this time with the effects of atmospheric gas, aerosols, reflection off the surface, and water column vapor removed so that the only quantity that is represented is the surface radiance. Because water is a dark target, a faulty atmospheric correction can introduce mistakes into the resulting image. The algorithms we use to estimate chlorophyll, CDOM, and suspended sediments are sensitive to variability in the shape of the remote sensing reflectance spectrum. If an image is improperly atmospherically corrected, then inaccurate estimates of these data products may result. If you are interested in building your knowledge of in-water optics, and the fundamentals of remote sensing, I highly recommend the Ocean Optics Webbook, shown here at this link. It is a free online source that is perfect for beginners. I still refer to this um, online book in my own research. For more information on remote sensing, data access, and processing tools, the second link, the NASA Ocean Color Web, has a wealth of information. If you visit this website, you will get a preview of what will be covered in next week's session. What are some of the advantages and limitations of remote sensing in aquatic environments? For advantages, there is synoptic coverage, meaning remote sensing imagery can collect data over large areas that would otherwise be impossible using ship or mooring observations alone. Next, as many of you know, water moves, the ocean moves, and so for many processes, frequent satellite overpasses are needed to capture natural phenomena. Unlike in land imaging systems where there are fixed targets where you can repeat on a 19-day revisit or a 16-day revisit, with the ocean, daily overpasses or even more than once a day are very useful for understanding dynamic processes. <clears throat> Many satellite sensors, such as MODIS, <clears throat> collect data on near daily revisit rates, and some of these dynamic processes, such as an algal bloom, can be observed with these sensors. Third, satellites can observe where ships cannot go. What are the disadvantages or limitations? Well, near daily overpasses may still be too infrequent to observe natural phenomena that occur on subdiurnal cycles. These include tides and the vertical migration of phytoplankton over the course of a day. Even within one day in a region near where I live, we see a 700% increase in the surface expression of chlorophyll from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. when we are observing a bloom of a vertically migrating organism. Water is a dark target, and if the sensitivity of the sensor is poor, or if the atmospheric correction is not well constrained, then the resulting imagery will be of limited use. As stated before, water moves. If sea truth measurements and the satellite overpass do not coincide, then it is not possible to validate the imagery. Compounded with this is the ubiquity of clouds in some regions of the ocean. This drawback is mitigated somewhat with the frequency of data collection, but it can still pose a problem. So to recap for week one, we talked about the course structure and an overview of RSET. I touched on the themes in coastal and open ocean applied science and gave some examples from these thematic areas. We learned about how the material in the water relates to the underwater light field, the surface remote sensing reflectance, and the algorithms that are used to derive chlorophyll, CDOM, and suspended sediments. 
we had learned the advantages and limitations of remote sensing of the aquatic environment. If you've not already had the chance, please be sure to review the on-demand Fundamentals of Remote Sensing Session 1 webinar. This series will have two homework assignments. The first will be assigned next week and the second during week four. Both assignments are due August 10th. Please join us for the next session on Wednesday, July 13th at the same time. We now have a few minutes for questions that you can enter into the chat window. Also, feel free to email us with any follow-up questions that you may have after today's session. Our emails are listed here. <clears throat> if you have questions about the course, any one of the upper three, Sherry, Cindy, or Amber, or if you have questions related to RSET, please send email to Ana Prados. Thank you for your participation. As a reminder, next week we will be discussing platforms and sensors for ocean observations data access, and processing tools. And we're ready for questions. OK, I do see a question here that says, explain TOA. Thank you for pointing that out. TOA stands for top of atmosphere. So. Usually we refer to this when we're talking about the sensor, satellite sensors that are outside or beyond the upper part of the atmosphere. There's one question here about the use of geostationary satellites. <clears throat> I have not presented any information for today on geostationary satellites. We will I will talk a little bit more about them next week during satellite sensors, but I will probably not be presenting data or access to geostationary data during this course. A geostationary satellite is one that is positioned so that it observes one region of the Earth or a disk of the Earth. And it can take multiple images during the course of a day. And one of the advantages of that is that you can capture information if you're sampling over um, several hours, like one capture every couple of hours during the course of the day. You could capture um, information such as how that diurnal or that diurnal vertically migrating phytoplankton bloom I mentioned, how it may be changing the surface expression of chlorophyll over the course of that day. So today I did not really go over geostationary, but I'll cover it a little bit next week. Okay, so one person is asking about the high reflectance in the near infrared when there is a high sediment suspension. In my research, I work in coastal systems on river plumes and algal blooms, and we get uh, have river runoff with high sediment concentration in the water. And similar to what you may see, depending on how concentrated the sediment is in the water, it may actually begin to appear as if it's a mud flat if you have very high um, sediment concentration. So if you're familiar with working with land um, remote sensing, you know that the reflectances are fairly high in the near infrared. And depending on how concentrated the sediment is, you can start to see that sort of effect on the, um, on the reflectance of the high sediment water. This can pose a problem. One of the areas that I work on is the atmospheric correction in that we make a lot of assumptions about how dark the water is in the near infrared. So like at 865 nanometers, we assume in the open ocean that the water will be dark um, because out in the open ocean, the water is absorbing the light there and it would be. But in the coastal regions, we start to run into problems with this because that assumption can't, um, isn't true. If we have high sediment load in these coastal waters, that will appear to have some color to it. And so we can't use that wavelength in our atmosphere correction.
Okay, there's another question about remote sensing of chlorophyll A and how you account for or correct for a high amount of sediment and CDOM in coastal areas like Louisiana. So the, as you may recall, in the example that I gave, I had um, highlighted the spectrum of at around 550 and 486, I believe, for um, the wavelengths that are used for that ratio. These are also regions of the spectrum that CDOM and sediment can have uh, strong absorption characteristics. So how do you deal with this? There are some other algorithms that are out there that are a little bit different than the one I described here, some semi-analytical algorithms that um, are available using the processing software that NASA provides called CDAS, and we'll cover that a little next week. And what they do is they're both based on an empirical approach and an analytical approach, and they simultaneously can solve for chlorophyll, CDOM, and for sediments um, using um, some modeling approaches for what you would expect. Another route that you could take in estimating chlorophyll in regions that have high sediment is if you recall from the spectrum that I was showing you, I said there's a peak at around 550 where our eye perceives green, and there's also a peak out at around 685 nanometers to 715 nanometers. And there are some approaches that take advantage of that peak out in that 685 range because CDOM and sediment are not having an effect on the light properties out there, but chlorophyll is um, what's happening is it's a re-emission of fluorescent light out at that higher wavelength. And so some people use that in a data product called the fluorescence line height to make estimates of what the chlorophyll would be. Okay. I'm just reading through the questions here, so let me catch up a bit. Okay, a couple of questions about atmospheric correction. Um, I mention it here, and it's also in the equation, and there are a few references. Um, I'll see if I can point to them on the next session, but atmosphere um, has absorbing gases, and it has absorbing particles, and it also scatters, those particles scatter the light, and the molecules in the atmosphere will scatter the light. And so <clears throat> uh, what you're doing is you're taking into account things such as ozone, other gases like CO2, CO, N2O in the atmosphere, you're taking into account the size distribution of the different particle um, particles in the atmosphere, if they favor small sizes or large sizes. Particles can be due to dust, um, it can be from biomass burning, and so um, there are a series of models that have been developed for what the particle size distributions are in different regions of the world and what you might be able to expect. And some of that is based on some work that was done in the 1970s. And so the algorithms that I've primarily used in the work that I do, because I generally tend to work on high spectral resolution imagery, are um, TAFCA, which is based on the AUTREM atmospheric removal model, and also on 6SV. Um, is another atmospheric correction algorithm I primarily use. Um, these are not the ones that I'll be discussing next week. Uh, we'll be using and talking about the atmospheric correction that's contained within CDAS. CDAS does use some of 6SV, but they also work, use others. I see a couple of very specific questions here that I would like to answer. Um, but I think that some of them might be a little bit more directed to me via email. So if you are asking me to make any calculations, um, then uh, like converting um, units or making calculations, I'm going to request that you send it to me via email, which is on the presentation. I'll state it here briefly. It's s-h-e-r-r-y dot l dot p-a-l-a-c-i-o-s at nasa.gov. Okay, a question about vertical migration of HABs. So um, if you're familiar with phytoplankton, um, some phytoplankton have a flagella or what looks like a little tail um, that is um, extended out of one side and it may have an additional um, uh, flagellum on it alongside its body. Um, these are single-celled organisms and the one I'm thinking of is a dinoflagellate, the one I've just described. 
Dinoflagellates are really successful phytoplankton in that they can move up and down in the water column. And um, generally, the structure, physical structure of the water column, it has a warm surface layer and then a distinct gradient in temperature, and then it's cooler below that. And that distinct temperature gradient is called the thermocline, and it acts almost like a floor or a ceiling. So the dinoflagellate, which requires light for photosynthesis, what it will do is during the evening, it will, with its little flagella, it will swim to this thermocline or just below the thermocline. And below that thermocline, it's very high in nutrients. It'll take up nutrients. And then as daybreak occurs and the sun starts to rise, that little dinoflagellate will turn around and it'll start swimming towards the surface so it can get to the light, so it can use those nutrients for photosynthesis. We get these really intense red tides here in the Monterey Bay in California where I live. And what happens is that all of those dinoflagellates say at nighttime, hey, let's go down and get some nutrients. They pick up the nutrients and then they swim towards the surface. So we can actually go out in a boat and be waiting to take samples and the water will appear bluish. And within about two hours, right around lunchtime, it just starts to become this bright red color. Um, the dinoflagellates have pigments that appear red to our eyes. And what's happening is they're all making it up to the surface and the concentration of chlorophyll can be really intense during those blooms. So that's a description of the, what um, diel vertical migration is. Okay. I'm still reading the questions, so sorry for the slight delay. Okay, I see a couple of questions coming up about CDAS. I'll cover this a little bit more next week. Um, so if you don't mind just holding on to your questions until then. Uh, it keeps coming up about image processing. If you have the Linux or Unix version of CDAS, you can process between um, different levels, and I'll go into those details next week. So if you guys don't mind holding on just a little bit on those questions, we'll get to it next week. <clears throat> And then in terms of atmospheric correction, some of the choices that you make on atmospheric correction for what the properties of the atmosphere are can vary over, depending on where you are, whether it's open ocean or over a coastal system, <clears throat> or over land, for that matter. So for example, if I'm going to be correcting data that I collect over the Great Lakes, say, for example, I want to use a, a chlorophyll anomaly over the Great Lakes. So if I have some climate average for chlorophyll over the Great Lakes, and I want to see how far that particular day that I'm looking at diverges from that um, average, that gives me the chlorophyll anomaly. Well, I'm going to need to atmospherically correct my data over that region, and the correction that I'm going, choices that I'm going to make for the Great Lakes will probably be quite different than the correction that I'll make if I were living in, um, say, Cali, Colombia, or closer to shore from there. And the reason is that I have different um, air masses above my region and also different influences of dust. Um, over a continental um, location versus a coastal location. Okay. Yeah, and just to restate, I'll be talking about platforms and sensors for ocean observations, data access, and processing tools uh, next week. So if you guys can just hold on a bit, I'd be happy to talk about that more. Um, one person asked a question of, I'm not sure if I'm going to read it just right, uh, which satellite data are used for phytoplankton categorization? So a new area, um, it's not that new, it's probably since about the mid-90s, but it's really expanded since the mid-2000s, is trying to go from our understanding of chlorophyll. So chlorophyll is really important for us to understanding phytoplankton biomass 
and what effect that may have on trophic transfer and climate models for understanding uptake of carbon dioxide and export into systems. So chlorophyll was one of the first drivers for understanding ocean color is trying to get a, an understanding of what is the chlorophyll concentration in the ocean so we can get a better understanding of these climate and ecosystem questions. We've moved beyond that in the last 10 to 15 years or so. And instead of just saying, here we have this bulk chlorophyll concentration, let's try to describe a little bit more information about what's in that chlorophyll. So just as I might look out onto a mountain and I see meadows and forest and built areas and grasslands, I can say, oh yeah, these look different. Right now, it, if I were an ocean color algorithm, I would just say, oh yeah, it looks kind of green over there and this is how green it is. But I couldn't tell you, those are forests. This is an oak, that's a conifer, and this is a meadow. So the direction that things are taking now is to try to be able to characterize the different phytoplankton groups that are out there. And there are different ways to characterize this type of biodiversity. We could do it by size class. So phytoplankton and cyanobacteria can range in size quite across quite a large scale. And if you were thinking of it in terms of the building that you're sitting in, it could go from a dust particle to the size of the building. That's the kind of scaling that we're talking about. So size class distribution is one way to think of phytoplankton biodiversity. Another way to think of it is by taxonomy. So is it dinoflagellates, or is it diatoms, or is it cyanobacteria? Because these different taxa can drive different ecosystems in different ways. And so that's probably not going to be what we cover in this course. It's, it's actually the topic of my own research. But um, we will not be going into what we call phytoplankton functional types. Um, so that would be a subject of a different uh, course. For as far as I understand right now, in terms of the world of applied sciences, I don't think that there is that much where they are using phytoplankton functional types to um, in applied science, except for one topic area, and that is in the detection of harmful algal blooms. Okay, so we're getting close to the end, and I've answered a bunch of these questions here. You guys have fantastic questions, um, and I think that we will be capturing a record of these questions as well. So I'll try to make sure that in the next session that um, some of the stuff that's more applicable to the next session, um, I'll make sure to address those um, as well. Um, there are a few here, and I know that some of you may be frustrated that I'm not answering all of your questions, but we may capture it in the, in the next session. Again, if we don't, send the question again, and I'll um, try to answer it. And also, again, if you're asking me to make a calculation, please send it in an email, because I'll be better able to focus on it there. Um, all righty. So Amber, I've, um, who is quietly answering questions for you guys, I think that what we'd like to do is just say thank you very much for all of your good feedback and questions. Um, and as a reminder, next week, we will be discussing platforms and sensors for ocean observations data access, and processing tools.